Hi, I'm Dr. Harry Lawson, the Chief Medical Officer for SIU Medicine, and today I'm joined by Dr. Michael Neumeister, the Department Chair of Surgery at SIU Medicine. Uh, Mike, thanks for joining us again. Yeah, great to be here. Today we have a different topic. Um, it's really about the news in Illinois that we're going to be opening up for non-urgent and elective surgeries and procedures on May 11th. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that because we've gotten a lot of questions about what those type of procedures are. So what is a type of uh, elective procedure and when are we gonna start doing them here in Springfield? Sure, well as you know, because of the whole uh, virus restrictions that we had, we stopped all elective surgeries, meaning those surgeries where the, it wasn't going to change the overall immediate outcome of the patient's condition. Those cases that were emergent, if you had a cancer, if you were in a trauma, uh, or something that may impair the ability for you to function later on as months go down the road, those were done urgent or emergently already. On May 11th, we're opening up uh, the surgery rooms now for elective procedures, and those are more oftentimes minor procedures, but they may be a part of a staged reconstruction. They may be something like a gallbladder procedure where you have a few attacks, but it didn't have to be done emergently. So there's a wide variety of these procedures, and they are not going to compromise your care to wait longer, but now, as the virus is the condition is the way it is today, we can start to operate on those folks. Yeah, and, and we've gotten guidance both from the state and the Illinois Department of Public Health yes. about the parameters that they're going to watch and make sure that things don't change as far as the COVID infection rate in our area. And we do have a region now for the state that was released uh, recently by the governor. Um, so we're gonna watch those things. Uh, patients also ask uh, specifically, um, is that going to be in all sites, the hospitals, or where, where are these procedures occurring? Sure. So each hospital has a main operating theater where a lot, a lot of the larger cases are performed. The day surgeries are done at their outpatient facilities. Memorial Hospital is opening their outpatient surgery. Uh, it's at the Bayless building, uh, as well as their main operating rooms. St. John's is opening the main operating room, but not opening the day surgery rooms just yet. Now, St. John's has 16 operating theaters that uh, they are opening up, so their day surgeries are going to be performed in all 16 of those as well. So, uh, as the volume increases, they may have to open up the outpatient surgery rooms as well, but I think they're doing it in more of a staged uh, fashion currently. And we're assuming that the sites for Memorial and for HSHS and Decatur might follow similar type of approaches. Correct. Yes. Um, obviously, regions uh, far from us, where SIU might be present, um, those particular issues will be based on the hospital in that area, areas like Quincy or Carbondale, but we're really just talking more about the Springfield and Decatur areas Correct. Um, for now. Uh, there's questions about elective procedures. Does that include things like cosmetic procedures? Well, certainly cosmetic procedures are elective, and uh, we have ways to uh, prioritize the way we're actually dealing with the surgeries. Right now there's a lot of patients that have been waiting for their surgery and so as a protective way to help patients uh, get in the queue for their surgery we have set up a different different levels or different tiers of prioritization. So the provider themselves will have their priorities of what patients should be done. Cosmetic surgery patients will probably have to wait a little bit longer to get their procedures done until the backlog of surgeries has dissipated and those that with functional needs get treated first. Once the provider has prioritized, then there is a surgery review committee that each hospital has that will also prioritize and make sure that patients are being done in the appropriate order. Following that, as you know, that every patient is also going to be tested for the COVID virus. And so that's a system where through the uh, IDPH, they will have their tests performed and then it'll be done about three days before surgery. Subsequent to a negative test, they'll then carry on with the surgery. So there's multiple levels of prioritization and ways we are dealing with the safety of the patients. 
And so along the lines of the pre-procedure testing you just mentioned, what are the other things that we're doing in the hospital spaces that, that maintains or, or uh, sets a, an environment of safety up for the patient? Sure. So each hospital has um, some way to actually preview your status, if you will, meaning that as you come in the door, you will actually be screened. You'll have your temperature take, taken at Memorial Hospital and St. John's, or you'll be asked a series of questions. These are screening questions to make sure that you are not a, a high candidate for having that virus. Subsequent to that, you'll be given a mask, and all the healthcare providers are wearing a mask, and all the patients will be wearing a mask. The other thing is that, unfortunately, family members will not be allowed to accompany the family into the waiting rooms or into the pre-operative holding areas prior to the surgery. Instead, they will actually be notified by the perioperative team that the patient is going to the operating room, things are going fine, and then be contacted when they are ready to pick up the patient subsequently. This will diminish the number of patients that are actually um, in contact with the general public, but also decrease the general public's contact with the, a number of other patients. Okay. You know, one of the things I think we probably want to clarify too, because um, we have our clinics and we have things that are often referred to as procedures that happen in our SIU clinics. And that's very different than the procedures and surgeries that are happening in a hospital yes. or, in an, or in an ambulatory surgery center. And so we, we have lots of different things that are termed procedures in our clinics. Some of them could be a type of diagnostic test. Some of them could be an injection or a skin procedure. Uh, and some could be a much more uh, highly complex type of procedure like an endoscopy where they're doing a visualization using a small tube of your vocal cords uh, or the upper part of your airway or your esophagus too. So, those are higher risk type of things. Yes. And what we're trying to do in our area is, is decide which of those types of procedures actually require pre-procedure testing and which of those uh, types of procedures require different types of personal protective equipment. Do you wanna mention any more about those types of procedures that are in our clinics that aren't surgeries, but they are termed procedures? So there's a wide variety of procedures or even minor surgeries that are done within our office settings. It's a safe environment. It has all the equipment required to do these procedures. Procedures can be, as you mentioned, the injections, which are very minor, but they can also be small surgeries, removing lesions on skin and, and the such. So, but there can also be those endoscopy cases that don't need sedation, but are at a higher level and at a higher risk, to be honest, because of the airway that is being transmitted back and forth from patient to provider. So each office will have their own prioritization of the type of protective equipment that the patient needs and the provider needs to provide safe, accurate, appropriate care for any one procedure or minor surgery. If I'm removing a small skin lesion, that may only require eye protection, mask protection, gloves and a gown. Um, and we use sterile equipment and sterile instrumentation anyway. If you are getting some endoscopy procedure, that may require a higher level of protection for the eyes, for the airways, uh, and the bodies as well. And each provider has that information, has those protective devices for you and for them. Yeah, and I think it's real important. So if patients here, they're gonna have a procedure done in our clinic space, they might not be required to have that pre-procedure COVID test. And so we wanna make sure that, uh, that no one gets confused there could be these minor procedures, minor surgeries uh, in our clinic space that don't necessarily require a COVID pre-procedure test. But certainly the, the um, types of procedures that we do in the hospital and in ambulatory surgery center, those things are gonna require pre-procedure testing. They are, and I think the, um, another reason for that um, COVID testing is you're gonna be interacting with a lot more people from the reception area, to the preoperative nurses, to the anesthesia, to the anesthetic uh, uh, assistants, um, surgeons, nurses, 
And I think because of the increased contact, it warrants a greater degree of screening. So a common question that we're getting now is, well, my procedure was canceled. Um, now we're going to be able to have these procedures done. How are we gonna catch up or how are we planning on getting all of these procedures done at this point? Sure. So each hospital has a strategy and each division, each department that, that does surgery has their own strategy. In part, that's some of the prioritization I mentioned earlier where the provider has said, we need to do these cases first, second, third, and so on down the line. And the hospital has a committee that also looks at that to see what they can do. The other thing they've done is, is modified the way surgeries are being um, blocked out per surgeon so that they, they know that there are some, some groups of surgeons that have a higher case log and do an enormous number of cases throughout the year and they've been able to do percentages and allow those surgeons still to get a, a number of their cases done. It's a fair system and they are working for, from those cases that ha, are longer out than more recent so that the patients can get the procedure that they need done, done in a timely fashion. Uh, another thing that comes up frequently is, well, I'm, I think I'm going to be coming up for my procedure soon. What are the different ways that a pre-operative visit with your surgeon might occur or with your provider and the post-operative visits? Sure. So right now, during all this uh, shutdown, we've actually initiated telehealth, telemedicine, virtual visits already. And the school has done a tremendous job in reaching out to the community and it's been very appreciated by all the patients to say I don't need to come in but I still get to talk to my provider and get answers to their problems and their concerns. Currently we are doing that for the majority of patients right now but as we do more surgeries we'll see that we need to see some of them postoperatively to address the postoperative incisions, any concerns, any issues that have, that have arisen. So Many of those will come back to clinic as they did before or after a surgery. However, not all of them need to. For instance, if I do an operation and I use dissolving stitches and it is a rather routine procedure, we could have this conversation and I can even examine just by visual um, how their uh, uh, body part that I operate on is doing. So not all of them need to come back postoperatively. And also, we can also screen patients, talk to them ahead of time, so our preoperative visit may actually be virtual as well. So, the very first time you meet face to face to your, sur your surgeon may be the day of the surgery. Mm -hmm. That may also be the way we're going to be doing medicine in the future. Yeah, I think as we're trying to negotiate how we're going to maintain social distancing for probably quite some time, even you know, in the next few months, uh, maybe longer. Um, and, and get back to operations and taking care of patients, we're going to have to figure out a variety of different ways to, to make sure we're doing the right thing for the individual patient that we're right. taking care of. I think we covered all of our questions regarding um, surgeries. Um, I do think probably um, just in general, uh, let's say a patient is going to have a procedure done at the hospital. Um, how will they know? Who talks to them and tells them about where to go for a test mm -hmm. and what's going to happen and, and how does that communication work? Because I think patients might be a little bit interested in, well, what happens when I'm going to have a procedure or surgery done at one of the hospitals? Sure. So much like uh, it was done before, if uh, the patient and the surgeon decide that the surgery is warranted, there is a discussion about the pros and cons and the risks of the surgery. All the preoperative tests are still going to be performed in the labs that did them before. X-rays, EKGs, or blood work that's needed. There is one other test that needs to be done, however, as we mentioned, the COVID test. So the nurse will actually schedule your surgery, but the perioperative team at each hospital will then take that information and then contact the patient to say, this is the time, this is the place you need to go in order to get your COVID testing. That test should be done within three days and hopefully sooner, 24 or 48 hours after the test, so that the hospital gets that information, the provider gets the information, the patient gets the information to say, I am clear for the surgery. Now, if the test is positive, then the surgery will be canceled and the patient will be notified as to what to do from that point on 
in terms of isolation or quarantine. Right, and, and uh, probably it's worth uh, restating that if we've moved somebody up into a surgical procedure now, uh, and it, perhaps it was postponable before, but now we don't feel comfortable with postponing it any longer, um, that positive test might need to be looked at as far as what we do with that patient. Sure. Those procedures that are still needed, urgent, urgent procedures, if you are positive, we still need to do those procedures. There are special protective measures and, and gear that we may wear, but for instance, if you are in a car accident and you happen to be positive, you should be at home, by the way. But if you are in that car accident, you will still be treated. We cannot not take care of patients, uh, even though they're, they're positive. But we will have other restrictive measures we employ in order to protect everyone around. Great. Well, Dr. Neumeister, thank you so much for uh, joining us again. And thanks for clarifying all of the, uh, all the details around the uh, new release of uh, elective and non-urgent surgeries on May 11th of, of this year. Um, and we appreciate all that information. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining us again and watching the video. And as always, stay well, stay apart, and wash your hands. Be safe, everyone.